Hello, I'm Andrew Kamei-Deitch and today I just want to draw a few concluding reflections as we look back on our course on pre-modern Japan. Now the purpose of our little class is not to really be, of course, exhaustive or to cover everything, but to try to just give you a bit of an outline very briefly in each of those short sections on an aspect of an era in Japan's pre-modern history. So if we look back today, I want us to think about a couple of things. First of all, I want us to think about the complexity of historical experience and how that conflicts with the modern myths we often have about history. So in Japan, we have in particular the Meiji era, so the modern reinvention of pre-modern Japan, which influences how we think about many things in the pre-modern Japanese world. So the monarchy in the Tenno, for example, when we talk about monarchy in Japanese society, this, dis this discussion is very strongly influenced by the modern transition that the monarchy went through in Japan. And that kind of clouds how we think about the pre-modern tradition. The same thing with warriors. We have this modern romantic image of the samurai and it's so radically different from the reality of warriors in the Japanese pre-modern tradition. So that's something else I've tried to draw attention to. Shinto and Buddhism, the role that religion has in Japan. Shinto, of course, is not a cohesive religion until modern times when it's kind of reconstituted in that way. So the relationship between Shinto and Buddhism, it's very messy, very complicated throughout Japanese history. And of course, relations with foreign countries, the role that, uh, that, that Japan has in, in trade and in cultural exchange. We saw, uh, we saw the relationships recently that Japan had with Europe. I talked about that, but also uh, way back near the start of the course, I talked about the influence of the Chinese tradition on Japan as well. So we have to remember that when we talk about Japan uh, today, often our image of the pre-modern world is shaped by these modern concerns and the modern kind of myth-making about pre-modern Japan, but it's actually quite different from the actual historical experience. It's sometimes quite difficult to lift the kind of surface stories and drama and romance and dig down to the actual real history that happened. So I want to leave you with some major themes to keep in mind about pre-modern Japanese history. One is systems of authority, one is social structure, one is religious traditions, another is cultural change, and finally relations between Japan and other countries. So these are all different things we should think about when we think about the pre-modern uh, Japanese tradition and how these have evolved. Let's just discuss each of these very briefly. Systems of authority, if we look far back in Japan, the first documented type of rulership that we find in records is a kind of, a kind of system of co-rulership where we have a kind of ceremonial figure and then they have another person with them who kind of handles the actual day-to-day -day running of affairs in the government. And of course, you find this pattern repeated again and again in pre-modern Japan, where you have one figure who is by nominally, they are in charge, but actually they're more like a ceremonial figure. And really it's someone else next to them who's actually carrying out the mechanics of rulership. We talked about the Ritsuro system and that court-centered polity and how that evolved. Then we moved on to look at the dual polity, where Japan had this kind of complex system in the early medieval period, where there's a warrior polity in, um, in, the, in Kamakura and there is the court at Kyoto. And the two of them kind of work together as these two sides of a political system. And then finally, we have the rise of warrior authority and the development of a kind of feudal system. How did social structure change? Well, if we go right back to the beginning in Japan, of course, we start out with tribal social relations. Then we have the emergence of the court-based system. I talked about the courtier families and the way that they organize society. Then we have warrior relations. And as warrior families become more and more important, their ways of organizing people, vassalage and the EA system, that more, uh, more male-centered kind of family lineage and so forth, this increasingly becomes the standard in Japanese society in parallel with that group becoming more and more powerful. 
And then of course we have the early modern hierarchy with that class system that I just briefly introduced at the end of our last lecture, which of course if you study early modern Japan is a very important part of that social political system, so that four class structure that existed at that time. If we think about religious traditions in Japan, of course, we have the traditional thought and folklore. Then we have the influence from China, so Chinese thought, Confucianism especially, metaphysics, the Chinese way of looking at the world and the influence that this has in Japan. Then, of course, we have the impact of the Buddhist tradition. And finally, of course, we also have Christianity that comes in in the Sengoku period. And of course, all of these also have had an impact on the development of religious consciousness in Japan. Cultural change, of course, we start off with looking at the oldest evidence of native culture. Then we find again the great amount of impact that influence from China had in art and literature and so forth. We can see the great contrast because, of course, if we look at what we have in the tombs, the coven, and when we compare that to later eras, we see the impact that that Chinese cultural impact has on Japan. We have the rise of court culture and, of course, Murasaki Shikibu, the tale of Genji and so forth, Miyabi as a way of thinking that aesthetic. Uh, then, of course, we move on to the medieval culture. I talked about how the medieval culture is, is really fascinating because this is where we get the dawn of so much of what is today called traditional Japan. And a lot of this comes from the spread of court culture that's fanned out in the wake of the Onin War. But we also have the development of more popular culture, where culture is developed at the local areas. And of course, we have the Biwa Hoshi and those performance traditions and so forth as well. And finally, of course, we have foreign relations, something else to remember. When we talk about Japanese history today, we tend to act as if most of, most of Japan's pre-modern world is somehow in isolation, and that Japan sort of stays into itself, and then it briefly has contact with the West, and then it goes back into itself again, and that really Japan's relations with the rest of the world are a product of a modern era. This, of course, is not true. I've tried to establish even very briefly that right from the start, Japan is involved with its neighbors, there's cultural exchange, there's commerce relations. If we go all the way back and look at China and Pekche, then of course even after official relations with China end, unofficial relations continue. We have the Mongol invasions, the attempt to bring Japan into the Mongol Empire, which fails. Then of course we have this uh, series of exchange with the Portuguese and the other Europeans. When the Europeans leave or and or are expelled, depending on the group we're talking about, eventually Japanese, uh, the new Japanese warrior government sets in place these exclusion edicts. But from this, we also have this so-called closed country myth. The reality is that even in the early modern era, Japan is not truly closed off. It's not truly isolated. More, it's returning to a state where it's dealing with its traditional trading partners plus the Dutch on the side. And so it's really only closed from a point of view of Europe and that kind of way of looking at the world. So really Japan has always been engaged with other countries and to some extent it's always been receiving cultural influence from other areas as well. And we always have to keep that in mind when we talk about pre-modern Japan, but it's not evolving in complete isolation, but it's evolving in response to other changes in East Asia as well. All right, so thank you very much for coming along with me on this brief and in hopefully interesting journey through the pre-modern Jap uh, pre Japan uh, world, and I hope that I will see you again. Thank you.